Bonjour à tous, bienvenue à Good cette rencontre. Bonjour Jean-Christophe Poutin, je suis très heureuse de vous accueillir ici sur la scène de Bibliotopia pour parler des flammes de pierre. Il faut être deux pour escalader, m'avez-vous confirmé à l'instant. Il faut aussi être au moins deux et toute une, une assemblée pour parler de, de littérature et discuter d'un ouvrage. Depuis l'apparition de, de, de l'Abyssin en 1997, vous avez publié plus de 20 romans aux histoires souvent inspirées ou tirées de votre, de votre expérience de terrain, puisque vous êtes et vous étiez médecin humanitaire, pionnier de l'ONG Médecins sans frontières, ancien président d'Action contre la faim. Vous avez aussi été ambassadeur de France au Sénégal et en Gambie. Les titres de vos livres pointent souvent hein, les nombreuses cultures que vous avez rencontrées au long de votre vie. Je les réduis à quelques éléments parce que sinon on n'aurait pas le temps de, de parler de cet ouvrage, mais si je dis tout ça, c'est parce que je voulais euh, en arriver à, à, à ce point que euh, les flammes de pierre est à part euh, dans cette riche bibliographie, puisque c'est la première fois que euh, vous vous attaquez à une passion qui vous habite et vous occupe depuis longtemps, c'est-à-dire euh, euh, l'alpinisme. Et peut-être pour, euh, pour commencer cette discussion, je, je m'interrogeais euh, justement pendant mon temps de lecture en me disant que euh, l'écriture et la lecture sont des activités assez horizontales. <rire> Le geste du stylo sur la page, la lecture et, euh, et, et l'alpinisme, vous l'expliquez le, vous à, à plusieurs reprises, et non seulement une activité verticale, mais devient une manière de voir le monde euh, vertical, euh, contrairement à notre plan de vision qui est souvent euh, horizontal. Quel, euh, quel, euh, est-ce que ce sont deux activités, l'écriture et l'alpinisme, qui sont complémentaires, contradictoires En tout cas, comment se sont-elles ménagées une place ensemble dans vos activités d'écrivain bonjour, bonjour à tous et merci d'être venu à cette rencontre. Moi, c'est vrai que je suis toujours intimidé de parler de la montagne, surtout ici, parce que je suppose que la plupart d'entre vous sont familiers de la montagne. Mais moi, d'une certaine façon, je suis toujours resté un enfant de la plaine, un enfant des pays plats. Voilà, et je suis né à Bourges, qui n'est pas réputé pour ses pics enneigés. Euh, ouais, ma famille venait plutôt du, du Pas-de-Calais, qui n'est pas non plus très élevé. Donc, euh, alors, pour garder vos comparaisons, ça remet, je suis un homme de l'horizontale, si je puis dire. En tout cas, c'est ce que je croyais. Jusqu'à découvrir, en fait, assez tard, la montagne, j'allais dire... Found the mountain at a fairly late stage of my life. I was around 20, and by mountains, I mean the Alps, and I'm not saying that the Jura Mountains aren't mountains. Of course not, especially not here. But uh, mountains were... J'allais dire fortuite, parce que... A fortuitous uh, encounter. My girlfriend at the time had uh, a cabin. We went hiking a couple of times. Quelque chose s'est révélé. Et c'était une réelle révélation pour moi. C'était quelque chose que je n'étais pas préparé pour. Il y avait dans ces. Que je n'étais pas préparé pour. Mais j'ai réalisé que ces landscapes et ces montagnes d'activités étaient quelque chose qui se fitait bien dans ma personnalité. Maintenant, je ne sais pas. Pour moi, l'écriture n'est proche de rien. Je dois admettre que l'écriture est comme rien d'autre. Je suis parti comme docteur. I chose a uh, kind of work uh, that uh, got me closer to other people. I grew up in the city of Bourges, which is a quiet city where nothing ever happens. Uh, for me, literature was not an end in and of itself. It was a window onto the world, and I was very much attracted by the outside world. So to me, what's essential is life. Uh, it's the work uh, that um, I was trained to do. It's uh, the work uh, that I took up later on uh, as a diplomat. So writing is not necessarily an activity that fits in all of this. It's a 
something that I did uh, on the side uh, that was a very intimate, very personal activity. So there's um, a dichotomy between uh, the two. Uh, there was uh, my professional life, and then there was uh, the writing. Uh, now, of course, uh, writing has become uh, my profession. I'm a writer, and I try to be as active as possible. So I never wondered about mountaineering and about making mountaineering a topic of a book. It's uh, an end in and of itself. Um, now, much closer to the mountain, I spend half of the year close to here in a cabin in Haute-Savoie that is uh, right across from the Mont Blanc. Uh, when I open my windows in the morning, I see the Refuge du Goûter. When I don't sleep at night, I see the lights uh, of uh, the climbers going up to the Refuge when I'm not there myself. So to me, it's quite important, but I'd never thought it would become a topic of one of my novels, and it's only very recently that uh, I decided to do so. So I don't think uh, these activities are complementary, and it was... Uh, it actually required an effort from me, because uh, mountains and mountaineering to me don't necessarily generate plots very easily. Uh, there were Frison Roche, Ramu, and all the writers who wrote about the mountains and about the Alps. And uh, ever since, uh, you only see mountains appearing in fiction uh, under the guise of a tragedy. Uh, plane crashing, someone who falls off a cliff, that's when mountains appear in fiction. But I had a hard time thinking that I could make out of this activity a uh, topic of fiction. So what kind of um, mountain are you interested in? Uh, mountain as the landscape for performance or landscape uh, as uh, the landscape of your activities? The, it's, uh, you mentioned this uh, complexity very early on in your novel, and I'll read. He began, he began to recount a series of anecdotes about mountaineers who had miraculously escaped from impossible situations, others who had overcome superhuman sporting challenges, and still others who had carried out admirable humanitarian operations for the benefit of distant mountain populations. I was staggering with exhaustion as we walked and could not find the strength to explain to Daniel that these strategies, these feats, these beautiful actions were exactly what uh, I regretted that mountain stories were limited to. Some people could write admirable stories about these events, but they would always lack something essential that would, to me, make the subject suitable for a novel. The soul that transforms a subject into a plot, a person into a character, that's what we call a story. It requires a beginning, an end, and above all, beyond facts, feelings. The heroes that Daniel suggested were wonderful robots, superhumans, great exemplary figures. But what had they felt? What were their desires, their regrets, their attachments, and their sorrows? The desires, regrets, attachments, sorrows, you were interested uh, in the desires, regrets, attachments, and sorrows of uh, Rémi and Laure. Uh, this, uh, the text that I just read serves as a prologue to your novel. You say how hard it is to find a story with uh, characters uh, who aren't there for performances. And then all of a sudden, you hear about Rémi. Can you tell us a little more about this uh, character? Well, just as an aside on this uh, issue, it's a bit of an anecdote, but four or five years ago, together with Ludovic, my publisher at Gallimard, uh, well, he told uh, Sylvain Tesson and myself that he wanted to go up the Mont Blanc. That's uh, what people who don't know anything about mountaineering say, we want to go up the Mont Blanc. And we said, well, we'll take you. We did take him up. Uh, he's 
not a sportsman. Sylvain used to drink quite a lot. Uh, there was a fourth chap uh, whom we hadn't noticed had a camera and was filming all the while. So we started in the cabin. We opened a bottle of wine. Then we went up. And so it was a real adventure, a real adventure. But we managed to go up to the summit, and Ludovic, who had never gone up a mountain before, gets to the summit. Uh, he was exhausted, but he made it up. And each and every time he spoke in front of the camera, he said, uh, he told us about his story, he was separating from his girlfriend, there were problems with his children. We forget about all this, and then later on, the friend who'd filmed everything told us, well, the film is ready. It's called uh, Mont Blanc Quête d'Auteur, and we want to screen it in Grenoble at the Mountain Film Festival. Would you be happy to come along? And we said, yes, sure. We went there, not expecting everything. There were 4,000 people in a room. It was a huge room. There were four movies being shown that evening. First movie, uh, guys with huge arms, uh, just guys going up. It was a feat, a huge, great performance. Second, second movie, uh, guys um, who jumped in a windsuit. They usually crash at the bottom, but oh well. Third movie, Base Camp, uh, K2, Annapurna, an, an avalanche, uh, helicopters, blood everywhere. And then fourth movie, our own, opening of the bottle of wine, etc. We felt, well, that we were, the four of us were there. Uh, we were feeling very ill at ease. I was. Uh, trying to identify where the exit was. And it was a resounding success. People were so happy out of the four movies. It was their favorite movie. They uh, asked loads of questions. Why? Well, because we were shown as human beings. The four of us who were climbing up the mountain, they could actually relate to the guy with the huge muscles. They could not relate to. It was way too abstract, too technical. It was too far away from their own reality. And that's the tragedy with um, these extreme sports. They're there for the show. What you see are superhumans. And I think that was the good thing about mountain literature of the past. If you read Premier de Cordé, it's a human story. There's suffering, there's hope, there's love. Um, these are things that I don't find in mountain literature anymore. If I wanted to write about the mountain, I wanted it to be through that kind of a story. And that story I heard about through a friend, a friend who is a mountain guide. Uh, they're actually two brothers. They're quite famous. One is a very famous mountaineer. He uh, opened uh, uh, many ways in the Mont Blanc, Patrick Gabarro and Philippe, his brother, without betraying any secret. Philippe. Well, the, the brother was uh, the one uh, who did the performances. Philippe was uh, in charge of his customers, took care of his customers, especially when they were women. Uh, that's uh, what I wrote, so that's the way it was. And one day, in the middle of uh, this uh, superficial life, he meets someone. He meets someone, and it's uh, love at first sight. He meets a young woman who was there with a group of friends. Uh, it's something that he's much more involved in. She comes back, she leaves again. She works in Paris, uh, in the banking industry. She's a very modern woman. 
And once in a while, she likes to go to the mountains. He stays in his valley, and uh, in actual fact, they share what's uh, the best in the mountains, um, sunshine, snow. They uh, climb mountains in the summer. They ski in the winter. It's mountain as a pleasure, despite the fact that there may be a, a storm or two once in a while. And that's a true story. One day, he's sick of uh, seeing her leave for Paris and waiting for her in his valley, and he says, well, I'll go to Paris. He shows up uh, in front of uh, his door, in front of her door. Um, knocks on her door, she sees him, well, she's surprised, uh, then asks, how long are you staying for? His intention is to stay. He stays a week, two weeks, a month. He uh, used to be suntanned. Uh, he's no longer tanned after a while. Uh, you're spoiling it all. I have to stop you here. There's still many things to say about your novel. It's a novel that uh, unfolds over time. You follow your characters over several months or several years. And uh, I'd like to come back to the anecdote of the movie that you told us about. It's very interesting. It tells us that uh, vulnerability is a value that generates uh, much more emotions as opposed to performances uh, that uh, are more difficult to share with the audience. If we take the two characters, Laure and Rémy, over time, we see them face with their own vulnerability, the vulnerability of their couple, but also their own individual vulnerability. And the mountain is there uh, to reveal their own vulnerability for uh, different reasons. They're vulnerable for different reasons. For some, the mountain implies a freedom, it's a horizon. For others, it's a prison. How come the mountain can be experienced in such different ways? Well, there are several things. The issue of vulnerability, if you allow me to come back to this, is at the heart of what interests us all in such a story, what are we faced with? Uh, mountains are hostile environment. What does such a hostile environment reveal about you, about your strength, about your hopes? That's what's interesting. It's the interaction that's interesting. And through the story of the relationship between these two characters, there's the relationship between the two, and then there's the relationship each have with the mountain. So there's a third character in this uh, sort of threesome. And to me, it seemed absolutely essential. It has always struck me watching documentary movies about the mountains. I find it hard to express vulnerabilities. There's a movie that was made by one of my friends. He called this le syndrome de l'accomplissement absolu. People who go all the way to the moon, there's nothing more you can do. And that triggers a certain amount of vulnerability. He'd done this with uh, Uli Steck, um, who was a great Swiss uh, mountaineer. He'd uh, gone up um, the south face of the Annapurna, which is uh, the hardest face of the Annapurna. There were two sides to the movie. There was Uli Steck, who told about his story, and then two French mountaineers who told about the exact same experience. Uli Steck, with his Swiss-German accent, with very limited vocabulary, managed to, gender, to convey a lot of emotions. You're there, you're with him, climbing that side of the Annapurna. And you really, you can really relate to all the questions he has uh, when he thinks he's going to die, his weakness, his vulnerability. 
he manages uh, to convey very simply. And then there are the two French mountaineers who are quite rep who represents fairly well uh, the world of sports, saying, well, yeah, yeah, that was hard. That was very hard. Ah, yeah, we tried our best. And if you want to ask them, well, what did you feel? They're incapable of expressing any feeling, whereas they've done the exact same thing on the exact same face of the exact same mountain. And the two French mountaineers had uh, experienced much uh, harder circumstances. Uh, and the French mountaineers at one point say, well, you remember on uh, the base camp at 7,000 meters in the morning, that morning, you didn't even make it, make it out of the tent. You, you could no longer put one foot in front of the other. Well, if you hadn't made it out, I would have just simply abandoned you. And you see the look on the face of the other guy. And he says, well, yeah, normal. So there was something happening there. But apart from that, there were no emotions. So it's extremely complicated. It's a little easier when you're not uh, in the extreme, and Laure and Rémy are not in extreme performances. Their practice is uh, a normal practice. There are ups and downs, uh, there's bad weather, there are storms, but apart from that, there's nothing credible that happens to them. Nietzsche said the best perspective is midway. It's uh, in this uh, sort of middle dimension that things are easier to express. So that about vulnerability. Now, to come back to your question about freedom, and uh, mountains as a prison, this is something that's very striking. In the relationship you entertain with mountains, you evolve over time, you change. And this is why it's interesting to have a love relationship uh, that evolves in parallel because uh, it evolves in stages. And one of, the stage, uh, one of the stages in your relationship to the mountain, if you don't go there very often, is to think that it's an uh, open space, it's wide open space. Whereas if you speak to people who live in a valley, they think it's a closed in space. It's a space uh, where they feel protected. Sometimes when I'm in my cabin in my valley across from the Mont Blanc, I feel that I'm locked up in a sense. So this environment is very peculiar. On the one hand, uh, it's the stage for adventures, uh, but it's also uh, protection, a safe harbor. I asked you about this question because uh, the topic of the festival is caring. And mountains uh, could help us flourish. Whereas in your novel, you say the mountains don't do anything. It is, doesn't give anything. It's what the people do in the mountains that count. Mountains don't have a universal effect on people. Yes, it's true. There was uh, the, the lockdown during the COVID-19 pandemic, I experienced it here in the mountains. I know in Switzerland uh, the policy was slightly different, but in France, uh, police and prefects uh, went the whole nine yards. They decided that they would uh, put mountains under surveillance. And during the lockdown, it was absolutely crazy. There were helicopters who would hover over the mountains several times a day to make sure that uh, while you were hiking, you weren't contaminating uh, animals in the wild. We were under surveillance all the time. This experience was very interesting uh, in the relationship we entertained with the mountain because all of a sudden this uh, space that I'd always associated with freedom, I go out of my cabin and that's it. I can go anywhere I want. And in this particular instance, it was the exact contrary. I would go from one fir tree to the next 
serait pas amusant de, de faire Now, braver ce genre d'interdit parce que c'est transforme tout de suite les choses ça pimente. Well, donc on we weren't able to move, but we did move around. We did go hiking during that first lockdown that was uh, very strict. So we would go um, uh, backcountry skiing, but we would take a sheet with us. We would take a white sheet with us so that we would put us. Uh, we would uh, put the sheet over our heads uh, as soon as we heard a helicopter so that they couldn't see us. Uh, two things could happen. It happened to a friend of mine above Mergev. The helicopter could not land where he was. Uh, it started hovering over my friend and uh, told him, you may be fined with a 135 euro fine. And then there was the more aggressive version with the helicopter landing and fining you, which is quite extraordinary when you think about it. It almost happened to me. I was with a friend. Uh, we were on a crest. Um, we were uh, about to uh, ski down. You know, we were about to take the uh, climbing skins off. It's quite impressive when a helicopter comes uh, or flies up to the crest of the mountain because you see it at the last minute. Uh, you see the face of the pilots. They didn't see us. But this led me to really think about this issue of freedom and the way such spaces have a critical role to play in a society such as ours, a society that is governed by the precautionary principle. We try limiting risks. We take care of ourselves. It's well and fine to take care of ourselves, but I think it's extremely important, especially for the younger ones amongst us, to have places where you take responsibility for yourself, for your own life. And there are hardly no such, spa no such spaces left. Uh, anywhere you go, people take care of you. Uh, there are bans, there are prohibitions, there are things that are mandatory, things that you aren't allowed to do. The mountain is a place, and here I'm referring to mountaineering, but I'm also, but, but it's also the case with, howdy, with hiking, and there are actually more deaths from hiking than from mountain climbing every year, just because there are more people who hike than who climb mountains. But mountain activities are activities where at one point you take the responsibility to expose yourself to a risk. It doesn't mean that you come in harm's way. Rebuffa said, uh, you look for difficulty, but not for danger. And if you look for things that are difficult, you confront yourself to your limits. And when you're confronted to your own limits, you feel something that you hardly ever have the opportunity to feel anywhere anymore, except at sea, but at sea, you're in a boat, whereas in the mountains, you're very physically vulnerable. You're like a small atom moving around. And for the time of this activity, you have control over your life. And that's something that we were deprived of during the lockdown while we were under surveillance. And these spaces are very easy to, to, to survey. To, it's much easier to ban people from hiking through the mountains. All it takes is two helicopters. It's much easier to do that than to put uh, Paris suburbs under surveillance. There are many more people. And actually, uh, the police has a, a website uh, that uh, on which they showed uh, how they track down criminals, uh, criminals with hiking boots and rucksacks, dangerous criminals, of course. And that's what they uh, displayed on their website. Now, it was the lockdown, it didn't last for very long. OK, fine. But I remember another country, uh, South Africa, uh, where I was trekking with uh, a couple of friends of mine. We were walking around. We leave our cars, we walk for about five hours with our rucksacks and everything, and then all of a sudden a ranger comes. Uh, hi guys, hello. Could you please show me your tickets? 
and we said, what? We were on trail, we don't have a ticket. And he shows us uh, down in the valley where we'd come from, there was a, a little gate, uh, and that's where you were supposed to buy a ticket. And he explained to us that for security reasons, because all of this is for your own good, of course, but for reasons of security, the trail was under uh, CCTV surveillance and you had to buy a ticket. But see how these things can evolve over time? Um, at the moment, uh, there's uh, something that's very topical. Uh, that's uh, summit licenses, especially for the Mont Blanc. From an environmental point of view, I can understand that. There are too many tourists going up the Mont Blanc. It uh, pollutes... Uh, the Mont Blanc, there are way too many people. You all see, uh, you've all seen pictures of uh, people standing in line before the new Refuge du Goûter was built. There were tents all around uh, the old Refuge du Goûter. It was dirty, there were no toilets. It was gross. It was really gross. So there's a debate going on right now with two tendencies, two schools of thought. Some people want to leave it open and others want it to be subject to a permit. On the Goûter side, they have a, a ranger service, uh, two people paid by the town, the closest town. Et qui, avant que vous montiez, sont en droit and de contrôler uh, si vous avez une liste de matériel, they une check that you have the right refuge, equipment, bon. uh, access to the refuge, etc. Tant mieux, mais en même temps, vous voyez, so, vous voyez vers quoi on va, quoi. But you see where this is heading. Voilà. Vous voyez comment ces espaces peuvent aussi devenir des espaces de contrôle. How these can also be, <laughs> become <laughs> spaces where everybody is under control. Uh, the idea that uh, the mountain might have taken oui. care of some people, oui, but now it's up to man to take care of the mountains. Yes, but why does there have to be this opposition? Why do they have to be mutually exclusive? I think we can agree that uh, on mountaineering, where everyone is free to do what they like, but people are responsible. On the summit trails, this would mean that mountaineers are aware of their responsibility and their impact, their footprint. But at the same time, let's not shift, try to shift the problem. If the glaciers are melting, it's not because a few mountaineers are walking on them. The mountains are falling victim to a chain of events. Uh, to do with global warming. So the trucks in the Vallée de Lave, waste treatment and incineration plant, which is huge, and waste is being brought all the way from Marseille, and that's in the Alve Valley. That's a little bit different than people walking on a glacier. That doesn't mean that you can do whatever you like in the mountains. It's easier to point the finger at uh, amateur mountaineers who leave their tins uh, behind them and their refuse behind them, but it's not really true. Let's talk about the Mont Blanc again. If we extrapolate, it's not really an honest argument because why is there deterioration on the Mont Blanc summit? It's because people who aren't proper mountaineers on the trail because it's uh, their dream to do this. They're not trained mountaineers, so there are specific problems on the Mont Blanc, Mont Blanc trail. Uh, you might find the same people or the same type of people on the Matterhorn. Uh, it's another... Uh, boulevard in summer with uh, single file uh, trail, a single file uninterrupted line of people. You might find the same thing elsewhere, but <coughs> let's try to keep the mountains free and act responsibly because it's a unique environment. Humanity 
won't be the same. Humankind won't be the same if we don't have access to weapons. Let's come back to your book. You say the mountain can be anywhere for people who know how to see it. You give the example of an ant carrying a pine needle and building its own mountain. So there's a metaphor that you use about mountains and the characters. Both of your characters are escapees from mainstream society. Let's start with Law, a woman who has had to overcome her origins. She's made it professionally. She has a career that she could never have hoped for. And as she spends time in the she begins to unlearn, divest herself of a number of these bonds that are not useful. And when Rémy arrives in Paris, he also unlearns a number of things that he habits that he has in the mountains. You often juxtapose cities and the mountains, Rémy and Julien, who have diametrically opposite ways of experiencing the mountains. For you, was this a novelistic device? Yes, because that's what a novel is made of. Long ago, when I began to write, I decided to use this form of writing. I started with essays on humanitarian work. And in essays, when they write an essay, it's a simplified point of view. It's good or bad, everything is good or bad, black or white. And in the novelistic form, what's interesting is the ambivalence and the variability of the characters. They can change, things about them can be revealed. And that's what makes a good subject. That's what makes a novel work. When you can reveal your characters little by little. And it's true that mountains, uh, it's a bit like a developing fluid in photography. Selon les circonstances, il vous révèle ce qui va se passer d'ailleurs, par exemple, lors this is what we see with Law. I don't want to tell you the whole story because you might want to read the book. But she goes to do some mountaineering with someone else. She's no longer with Rémy. And somebody who has the same social background as her. Except he's not Rémy. And he's not really like her. And the mountains are going to show this up. Because in a situation where the weather is deteriorating and they're in danger, what comes out is that he's not at all what she thought he was. So the mountain as a source of revelation of people's characters. But when you delve into this metaphor, you see how rich it is. Uh, in the book, there's an accident, not a mountaineering accident. Uh, and uh, the character undergoes rehabilitation. There's a rehab center near where I live. It's a former sanatorium that has been turned into a rehab center. People who've had motorcycle accidents, car accidents go there. It's in the mountains. But the mountain is there as a metaphor for verticality. Verticality is what they're seeking. Most of these people are lying flat out on a bed. They can't stand. They can no longer stand up uh, alone. So standing up again is coming back to a vertical position. And the mountain is in this vertical position. It's the quintessence of verticality. It's uh, at the. It's. The essence of the human being. This is what we all want. Not all of us will 
achieve it. Some people will remain handicapped all their lives. But everyone wants to be standing up on his or her two feet. So uh, this is a rich metaphor. I'm not saying that you have to be interested in the mountains to get this. I know that there are lots of people who aren't interested, but I met a lot of readers since I wrote this book who are not necessarily interested in the mountains as such, but who understand that mountains have a sort of universal and symbolic value, something that is far beyond the technical aspects of mountaineering. It's universally human. I read another book a few years ago. I had come back from a diplomatic posting. I wanted to do something different. And I wanted to uh, come back to a more normal life. And I went on the road to Compostela, all the way to the Santiago. This is a horizontal trail, but a lot of people who wrote, read my book, sent the Santiago, made the relationships, uh, the relationship with the verticality. So there's uh, teaching there, teaching that I learned on the trail. When you're on the trail, you feel like you're going somewhere, and it's true. It's a pilgrimage. I, I mean, I didn't do it for religious reasons, but the, there is a destination. But when you arrive in uh, Santiago de Compostela, uh, there are Volkswagen garages, everywhere. Uh, the church is there somewhere. Santiago is there somewhere, but it's a bit disappointing. And you realize at that point that the important thing is not the destination, it's the, it's the journey. It's what you experience on the journey. And mountaineering is the same. For a very long time, everyone wanted to reach the summit. It's a bit like the destination when you're on the trail to Santiago. And for a while, there were even nationalistic uh, overtones. All European nations uh, uh, divided up the major summits, the English, the Italians, K2, who's, who else is going to, uh, who's going to atta tackle this summit. But summits are no longer the important thing in mountain climbing. What's important is movement, the journey. And Stéphanie Baudet, who, a French mountaineer who wrote a very beautiful book, calls it vertical yoga. Every gesture, every movement has a, an importance. So it's that transposition that I, I like. Yes, this is something that you suggest in the book. I'm one of the people you mentioned who's not particularly interested in the mountains. So I thought all of these words, all these adjectives that you can use to describe a mountain, uh, I thought it was amazing. So uh, literary uh, question. I know that you keep notebooks. How, well, maybe there are two questions in here. The first is, do mountains have, a, are they, a source of suspense to, in the plot, uh, because we're worried about people falling throughout the book. How can you carry the plot when you know that this uh, pressure is there? You sort of spoiled it when you told us that there's an accident that takes place in the book. But this is uh, something that's very obsessive in the book. The second question is, I know that you write in your mountain hideaway. How do you go about it? Do you use note your notebooks? How do you enter the scene that you have created of the mountains? Now, I don't take notes. I never take written notes. I doodle, I draw. When I travel, I 
have uh, uh, sketchbooks with watercolors and drawings because I think memory is a rich thing. The human memory is an emotional memory. Not, it's not a m the memory of the machine. And our memory selects uh, things that are related to an affect. You lived in a place, you suffered or you loved or you had an experience. The memory will remain vivid because there's an effect attached to it. If there's no emotion or effect, you might take notes, copious notes. Uh, I mean, I, I saw this on the trail to Santiago. People were writing and writing in their notebooks. I didn't know what to write. It's raining. I put my rain jacket on. Who cares? So I prefer to let my memory do its job and be able to count on my memory on when I begin to write. The, Memories that come back will be the important ones. If they emerge from my memory, even temporarily, it's because they are uh, charged with emotion. So I deliberately don't take notes. Now, with respect to action, uh, accidents and the uh, dramatic ac uh, suspense or attention in the, in the book, for the last few years, whenever I start uh, writing a new book and I'm working on its structure, I think about how the actual mechanics of it. I'm one of those writers who feel that a book it needs to be put together a bit like a bomb. It has to go off at the right time, not too early. Or, or like a watch, if you prefer. And I've always found this impressive. Not easy, because uh, I don't see a lot of writers who will talk about this, especially in Gallimard. All of the Gallimard authors uh, seem to have divine inspiration. But I, for me, it's, Boko, it's more, much more mechanical, and it comes with hard work. You're m making yourself, uh, you're showing yourself uh, to be vulnerable. Yes, well. Yes, it's right along, along the lines of the theme. And this idea of dramatic tension, uh, I've used this in most of my books. Whether you're talking about a crime novel or any other kind of book, there's always a determination to offer the reader a story that makes him or her want to follow you, follow you in your uh, plot line. It's particularly easy to do this with a story that takes place in the mountains because the risk factor is n really inherent and it's total a total unknown. Uh, we never know if there's going to be a rock slide. Well, now we have pretty reliable weather reports, but uh, and, and we have a better idea of uh, when a major storm is going to show up. But uh, as somebody said, uh, the weather report is uh, a report of the weather that uh, it should have, that should have happened. Anyway, I'll tell you another, I'll make another confidence. I think this is a bit of an artifice. The accident, an accident in real life doesn't obey the same rules as an accident in a novel. Uh, an accident happens suddenly uh, with no warning, whereas in the story, there's the suspense that leads up to the accident, accident dramatic tension. In real life, there's no dramatic tension. It uh, hits you over the head. Well, we're still afraid of accidents, aren't we? Yes, but it's usually, they usually happen at the time when you expect them least. Four or five years ago, I had an accident. I was climbing with a friend, and a piece of the rock came free, and I fell, uh, I fell off the cliff, basically, ba fell backwards. Uh, luckily, I was held by the, the rope. I broke my coccyx. I was lucky. I mean, I'm not going 
going to brag about it, but it's very painful. But it could have been much worse. I thought uh, it was going to be much worse. If I'd fallen on my head, I wouldn't be here today. So, you see, uh, that's a real-life example. There have been other close calls, but never a, a fall like that, which was pretty dramatic. It happens so quickly that there's no dramatic tension at all. The minute before, you were thinking about something else, and the second after, you can't say, you can't even remember what happened. You, there's no way you could describe it. So this dramatic tension that we see in the book is not something that happens in real life. It's not about the accident. It's about the fear of the accident. That's the uh, novelistic tool. And it's not really the same thing as a real life accident. And you can't use uh, this artifice too often. Uh, I mean, this isn't a horror novel. And I'm certainly not suicidal. I have children. I don't particularly want to leave this world. I'd like to go home after my day of climbing. So uh, we accept this tension. But I think this is also something that's very universal, like death. As a doctor, uh, I saw many people who'd had uh, a stroke or something, something that happens in a split second, uh, totally unexpected, and they never see what hit them. It has nothing to do with the fear of death, which you can live with for years or even your entire life. Uh, it, it happens when you're, when it's not, the fear happens when it's not happening to you. Thank you very much. Uh, time is flying, so I think I'd open this up now to the audience. If you have questions. Wait for the microphone, please, ma madam. Thank you very much for your book, which I really liked, as I liked all your books. Let me ask you how you live in proximity to the mountains. So I, I'm a skier, not a climber. And last winter, I went to Mejev for the first time, and I was surprised to see the crowds, the luxury restaurants. And you talked about this nightclub, the open air nightclub, where people go uh, to dance on the f between Friday night and Sunday. Isn't Mejev uh, the Alpine equivalent of Acapulco? Uh, how do you how do you deal with that? I don't live in Mejev. I live on the other side, uh, Saint Nicolas de Verros. La Folie Douce is the nightclub you're talking about. It was built there so that the British could uh, then slide down the hill on their stomachs after they'd had a few drinks to get to their ho hotels. So they don't come to my side of the mountain. Uh, I don't know about the analogy with Acapulco, but. I don't, um, I never do any downhill skiing. I, I haven't done any for years, and I think it's really dangerous. There are many collisions now. People hit each other at high speeds. It's horrible. Even if you're a good skier, uh, I'm not a great skier, but I, I manage, but even if you're a good skier, uh, you can still be, you, you can still have a collision. Well, January is fairly calm, and if you want to ski, that's a good time to go, but I, I don't ever ski in these resorts at all. Where you're right is that all of this is related, and what's interesting is that um, from time to time, there's a debate about mountaineering and uh, backcountry skiing, saying how dangerous they are, how much they cost in rescue fees, uh, they put people in danger when they have to go looking for them. They damage the environment, etc. But there's a huge industry tearing up the mountains. Look what they do with the ski runs during the win during the summer. The bulldozers are out digging. Uh, the chairlifts are bigger and bigger. Everybody thinks that, everybody, nobody seems to think there's anything wrong with that. So this is why I advocate 
uh, personally not accusing mountaineers or s for damaging the mountains. I think there are other activities that are much more damaging, especially mass tourism, which is uh, really f frightening. During a lockdown, this took on huge proportions. My road uh, ends at the plateau. And they decided to ban people from taking the chairlift because they might contaminate each other in the chairlift. So the lifts were closed, but the resort was open. So what did they? What did people do? They drove with their children up to the highest point they could reach, let the children ski down, and then they would go down and fetch them and drive back up. So they were using their cars as chairlifts. So they had to close the doors, uh, the, the roads, so that these 400 cars would stop going back and forth, and they replaced it with a shuttle. So in the shuttle, you had people uh, standing two inches from each other, uh, but that was not dangerous, apparently. Why did they do this? Well, because these activities represent a lot of money, and nobody wants to stop them. So no matter what happens, even when there's a pandemic, they'll, uh, anything, they'll do anything to keep uh, them going. Uh, it's easy to blame the mountaineers and send out the helicopters, but that's the story of uh, La Folie Douce, the nightclub. Any other questions? In that case, let me remind you that uh, Les Flammes de Pierre uh, and your other books are upstairs at the bookshop table, and you will be available to sign books for anyone who would like to purchase them. Thank you again for coming to speak to us today. Thank you to the audience. Thank you, Salome, and I uh, wish you a good rest of the festival.